Tension between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan on a scale not seen in years. Fighting broke out over a disputed border area. Although a truce was agreed, it's not stopped. So can this violence be contained or will it escalate into a wider conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahalbarra. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan have been in a dispute over land and water resources for more than three decades. But that's recently escalated into the heaviest fighting in years and raised fears of a wider conflict. At least 40 people were killed in the cross-border shelling and thousands evacuated. The fighting broke out on Wednesday near a water facility in an area claimed by both nations. Villagers from opposing sides threw rocks at each other and border guards then fired guns and mortars. The two sides now say they've reached what they call a complete ceasefire. That's after an initial truce broke down. The heads of the country's state security bodies announced the agreement in a joint briefing on Saturday. When we discussed this, we reached principal agreements to solve the issues in the interests of securing peace and stability in both Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. I think we can achieve that. I hope there will be full silence, the peace, the calamity in our countries, in particular in the territories on the border. We very much hope that the rich decisions which were wrought in the protocol will be executed. The latest fighting began after Tajik officials set up cameras to monitor a water supply facility near the Kyrgyz village of Koktash. Both nations have claimed areas mainly after they gained independence from the Soviet Union when it collapsed in 1991. A large part of the Tajik-Kyrgyz border remains unmarked, fueling disputes over water, land and pastures. Kyrgyz and Tajik delegations have held several rounds of talks but failed to end their disputes. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are both members of the Russian-dominated Collective Security Treaty Organization and they both host Russian military bases. Moscow has offered to mediate, urging both sides to negotiate a lasting settlement. Charles Stratford reports from Osh in Kyrgyzstan. The Kyrgyz Ministry of Internal Affairs has announced that 25 bodies have been found in the town of Golovnaya. They're reporting that these people were killed in a mortar attack by the Tajik military on April the 29th. They've also released some statistics on the kind of structural damage, damage to homes um, during these attacks. They're saying that 70, 78 houses have been burned, uh, two schools, three border posts and 10 petrol stations. Now, the press office for the uh, president, Sadr Juparov, they're saying that the situation is, in their words, relatively stable in that area. We are hearing reports that uh, the Tajik military have withdrawn back across the border. We know that there's been a large mobilization of the Kyrgyz army to that area, as you would expect. And interestingly, some news coming out from the Baitkan local authorities uh, along those borders. They're saying that 58,000 people were evacuated from the area, 52,000 of whom they're reporting as being women and children. So. Another indication of just how severe, how serious these clashes have been. Charles Stratford for Inside Story in Osh in southern Kyrgyzstan. Let's bring in our guests in Prague. We have Bruce Panier, journalist and correspondent at Radio Free Europe specializing in Central Asia. In Moscow, Viktor Olovich, political analyst and lead expert at Center for Actual Politics. In London, Domitilla Sagramoso, lecturer in security and development in the Department of War Studies at the King's College London. Welcome to the program. Bruce, are we talking here about an isolated incident or something that could potentially become a wider military confrontation? Well, you couldn't call this an isolated incident. Uh, you know, for the last 15 years, anyway, they've been having problems along the border that 
uh, used to used to just uh, end with some fist fights or vandalism of, of a car or something like that. But um, so it's been going on for for a while. But this was much much more serious. I mean, usually in the past these things were you know isolated to use your term. I mean, they, they were confined to one small area. This time. All of a sudden, we saw the Tajik forces attack along a long stretch of the border with Kyrgyzstan at several different places. The problem started in one area, but then it quickly spread, you know, many, many kilometers along the border. So this is the first time that we've seen pockets of fighting break out so quickly uh, and such a long distance along the border. So it's much more serious. Mm -hmm. Whether this means a military conflict, you know, I don't know. They pulled back and usually... There is periods of calm after this, and we'll have to see. Like I said, it's far more serious than it's ever been before. Victor, the Russians have offered to mediate. They're asking both parties to set aside their differences and seek a permanent solution to this particular problem. Do you see an opening for such uh, such a permanent settlement here? Well, it's important to note that the current uh, borders of the Central Asian Republics were drawn in the 1920s and 1930s when they were part of the same country, of the Soviet Union. And so the uh, potential economic, uh, political, ethnic, and other conflicts uh, at that time uh, were not um, as uh, important since they were within the same country and those administrative borders did not play as important a role. Of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, these borders that don't always reflect uh, the economic, ethnic, and other interests of the neighboring uh, Central Asian republics, they came to the fore and uh, played a much uh, more important uh, role. So we have seen these uh, border conflicts, uh, including with Kyrgyzstan, uh, for a number of years. Uh, several years ago, there was an internal mm -hmm. uh, conflagration in Kyrgyzstan involving its Uzbek minority. As far as the Russian position on this, both Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are, as your correspondent noted uh, several minutes ago, members of the uh, Collective Security Treaty Organization that was founded uh, by, by Russia, by Moscow. And of course, Moscow is interested in this uh, internal, mm -hmm. uh, in this disagreement between two members of the organization. Uh, being uh, resolved as soon as possible. And, of course, Moscow is willing to provide uh, its diplomatic and other um, uh, resources to help resolve this uh, matter. All right. But um, that being said... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me go to Domitella, because now we're talking about, as you said, something that goes back to the demarcation of the border during the... Uh, a rule of Joseph Stalin with complete disregard for ethnic, demographic and tribal considerations. Now you're asking people to come together and rethink a new geographic map. Is that possible from a perspective of both the Tajiks and the Kyrgyz? Um, I think we're not asking them to redraw the borders. I think part of the problem is exactly uh, the, there was a uh, the, there was seen a risk uh, that there would be a redrawing of the borders uh, because uh, the Kyrgyz uh, head of the security national security committee uh, was talking in March about uh, uh, redrawing borders around uh, the village of um, of Boruch. Uh, and that created a lot of concern uh, among the Tajiks. Uh, and uh, he was suggesting that they would get another piece of land uh, uh, in compensation. So I think that uh, the, one of the most dangerous uh, aspects would be to sort of redraw the borders. What I think what is important is to actually demarcate the borders. I think the solution would lie in trying to finally uh, decide, uh, you know, how the borders are to be deline delineated in that mm -hmm. area. The problem is that uh, you know, we have all these enclaves and many areas where villages of um, Kyrgyz and Tajiks are almost sitting side by side. And uh, there's only, uh, you know, there's these roads connecting uh, Tajikistan sort of mainland with its enclave. Uh, and, and that creates a lot of instability. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and besides the whole question of water resources, as we know in this case, there was also the question ar around uh, the Galovnoi water um, uh, um, uh, intake facility. So all these questions uh, need to be finally settled in some way. And okay. I think the fact that... Yeah, because the thing is uh, here is that you have the demarcation or uh, agreement of uh, 
uh, that was established in 1920, and this is going to be my question for Bruce. However, the two countries seem to have two different geopolitical maps of their own. The Tajiks are saying, let's go back to 1920, 1924. The Kyrgyz say we have our own map of 1958, 59, and therefore we would like to see some concessions before we can move forward. You know, that's one of the problems is they're looking at different maps and that, you know, this is one of the first things they have to agree on before they can make any progress on border demarcation at all is to try to figure out which maps they're going to use or if they're going to compromise on this somehow or another. You know, I mean, as my colleagues have rightly stated, part of the problem is that the, the new government and the, the head of the security service, uh, the new government in Kyrgyzstan, has really been pressing this, um, you know, that they're going to finish these these border demarcations, not just with Tajikistan, but with Uzbekistan also. And I think it made a lot of people nervous uh, that, that they might lose something um, because this was seemed to be going so quickly all, uh, all of a sudden. Uh, you know, and so this is this is going to be the problem. What uh, you know, what land belongs to me and what bel land belongs to the other side. There's a lot of things here. You know, it's generations farming or, or tending that same kind of the same plots of land for a while. There's cemeteries in the area that mean a lot to the local people, uh, you know, so it, it's real difficult to come to some kind of compromise. And I know from being down there a lot, too, that, that all too often the decisions that they agree on in the capitals uh, don't really reflect the local sentiment. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the people, they are consulted sometimes, but a lot of times um, they don't, they aren't. And what's important to them aren't taken into consideration when they start talking about agreements over this section of the border. Victor, we're talking about a delicate task ahead for all the parties, because when you're talking about 471 kilometers, which are still disputed out of 971, this is a tinder box that could blow up any time. Well, sure, but uh, we have to take into consideration the geographic and demographic uh, uh, facts, uh, statistics. Uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan is uh, the smallest of uh, Central Asian republics. Uh, it has a much uh, weaker military and smaller military uh, than neighboring um, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. The Tajik army is much more proficient and uh, uh, resourceful uh, since it uh, took part in the uh, protracted civil war in Tajikistan in the 1990s. The Uzbek army is much more numerous. It's very, it would be very difficult for uh, the Kyrgyz government uh, to uh, change borders in a way that would be beneficial to Kyrgyzstan appropriating land that is uh, considered uh, belonging to its neighboring, uh, to its neighbors. Uh, of course, the head of the National Security Committee, Tashiev, who has been mentioned here several times, has made a number of uh, nationalistic, very nationalistic uh, statements, uh, both regarding uh, the border with Uzbekistan. And uh, these uh, statements have also alarmed uh, Kyrgyz's, Kyrgyzstan's neighbors to the south, in Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. And when, um, when some, uh, when the uh, when members of uh, the Kyrgyz government announced that they had plans for a construction of a new reservoir in a river that also supplies uh, Tajikistan, and that they were not about to go into negotiations about this, the construction of this reservoir. Of course, the Tajiks uh, were, became uh, quite concerned about that, and they decided to take this action. It's also interesting to note that this conflict uh, took place exactly at the time when the heads of the National Security Councils of, uh, of the member states of the Collective Security Treaty were meeting in the capital of Tajikistan, in Dushanbe, and discussing the threat, uh, the potential threat from Afghanistan, uh, where Americans are, of course, planning to withdraw, and there is a potential uh, mm -hmm. threat from the Taliban being reconstructed there. And as the, uh, as the chairman of the Kyrgyzstan National mm -hmm. Security Council was discussing that in Dushanbe, the Tajik forces undertook this action. All right. Uh, so so uh, this conflict... Mm -hmm. It is definitely... Uh, we're talking about something that could further degenerate. And this is why I'm going now to Domitella. This is a problem. You have a border area which is disputed between both countries. And they, we're talking basically about areas which were used for grazing and access to water for centuries and centuries. Now you're telling people it's about time to rethink the way we used to have access to those particular 
uh, areas. From a technical perspective, we've seen that it's almost impossible globally to draw lines, to draw demarcations in different conflicts in the world. We might be left with one particular option, which is bring all the countries to talk about sharing the management of, of the resources there. Uh, definitely, as far as water resources in Central Asia is concerned, you know, it's very important to reach an agreement on water sharing. The problem is, um, you know, who is who is benefiting most from these arrangements. And if we look at the mechanisms uh, generally that were set up around uh, the sort of the Amordaria and Sirdaria basins, they tended to benefit the so-called downstream countries. Now, in this case, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are both upstream countries. Uh, and that also creates problems because they are trying, uh, you know, that the Tajiks are trying to build a dam, uh, as was mentioned, the Kyrgyz want to build additional reservoirs. So certainly there is, there's been in the last 30 years, a lot of efforts to find mechanisms of joint management. Uh, so that is an issue that can be achieved because it has been achieved in many other parts of the world where uh, rivers are being shared. Uh, and then there is a question of the demarcation of the borders, which we discussed. And I think that it, it is not impossible, but it sometimes requires compromise mm -hmm. and commitment to the agreements reached, which is often part of the problem, is that uh, even, um, you know, Tashiev was sort of also renouncing some of the agreements that had been signed with uh, Uzbekistan uh, regarding the border. So often the problem is sort of the commitment to agreements reached and the fact that the borders have been drawn in such a way that they are very complex, uh, they, are, they are not sort of linear, uh, they, bring, they bring, uh, they cut in through sometimes mm -hmm. areas of, of multi-ethnic character. So certainly there is a problem, but I, I don't think it is not uh, possible to resolve it. It, la it requires a lot of political will, and it requires not sort of resorting to sort of nationalist rhetoric, I think. Bruce, both countries have been talking for years about the need to solve this particular problem. But in practical terms, both countries have introduced a land codes, basically a reform of the agricultural uh, lands in that disputed area, which could result in handing over parts of those lands into the private sector. They seem to be completely in denial about the fact that there needs to be a problem to solve before you move into any reform. Yeah, well, you know, this is true. Uh, you know, the sad part about this is as this conflict has, has escalated over the years, um, you know, a lot of money that, that could have gone toward developing this area is, is it ended up going toward uh, fortifying borders and, and, you know, bringing more security forces into the region. Uh, it is one of the problems, and, and I'm not sure that there is a good solution uh, to any of this, especially now. It's going to be real tough. Um, you know, there, there's, there's also the feeling, you know, uh, as Farouk was mentioned, this enclave, which belongs to Tajikistan, but you have to go through Kyrgyzstan to get there, and you have to... Uh, you know, you have to drive right right through the heart of Kyrgyz territory, and all of a sudden you're at this place, and they've been spending years, you know, developing the agriculture there. And it was mentioned as, as a possibility for a land swap, uh, Tashiev, whose name keeps coming up here, said we would trade this for something else, you know. But but again, this is the kind of problem that they run into when they when officials start to talk about what could resolve the issue. Um, all of a sudden, the locals hear about this, and it's a total surprise to them, uh, you know. And so there was instantly... Uh, pushback from the from the residents of Baruch, which is, they're all Tajiks, of course. Um, you know, and then the government, the Tajik government, a very rare move of, of the president actually going and visiting this this enclave, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. He'd he only been there twice in 25 mm -hmm. years, and then all of a sudden he showed up again at the start of April to, to make the point that we've never discussed trading this, and we never will. Uh, you know, so you see there, the, instead of like leading to compromise, it actually solidified the current positions okay. that they, both the government appears. Victor, when you have populism on the rise, the two leaders, Sadir Japarov and Imamali Ramon, rejecting compromise, expressing uh, views which are critical of the other party, you get a sense that is going to be a long way before there is a practical realization that it's about time to solve this particular border dispute. Well, uh, it would be it would be very difficult to find a permanent solution to this anytime soon, uh, for the reasons you stated and for some others. First of all, Japarov is a relatively new uh, president in Kyrgyzstan. He is using uh, he and Tashiev and some other members of the Kyrgyz government are using 
uh, nationalistic uh, populist language rhetoric to gain uh, to garner more support and it would be very difficult for them to make any concessions without uh, without taking the political responsibility for those concessions which they are not ready to do at this point at the same time in Tajikistan the president Mamali Rahmon is uh, uh, according to reports, getting ready, has been getting ready for some time now to possibly pass, uh, uh, pass power down to his uh, son. Mm -hmm. And it would be very difficult for him to uh, make concessions uh, to the Kyrgyz side. Of this particular uh, moment. Another reason would be that uh, Tajikistan, uh, at this moment, and also another reason is that, as I mentioned before, Tajikistan it has a much uh, more powerful military okay. than Kyrgyzstan. There would be they do not feel a need or a reason to give anything up to to the Kyrgyz. Okay. So, but however, in this situation, it would be very difficult for that to, to happen. I see your point. But then, Dometella, we're talking about vague border lines that continue to stoke unrest, and it brings back the memories of 2004, 5, 8, 11, 14, and 15 when clashes erupted about the same problem. So unless there is a, a solution, we are likely to see further clashes and p possibly a war between the two countries. I, I'm not so sure we will see a war. Uh, I think for the for the factors that were mentioned by the previous speaker, I don't think, um, I mean, we can expect a, a full-out war. And, and I think the neighboring countries, uh, especially Russia, would try to do anything to, to stop this kind of, of massive confrontation. Uh, but I think we can expect this kind of, of clashes in the future. Uh, and I think it's very sad because I was reading some of the reports how people, uh, you know, for many years had been living very peacefully, but the area has become increasingly sort of militarized. There is increasing suspicion. Uh, there is a populist rhetoric. Uh, so I think that probably sort of, uh, you know, there are um, tight resources. There is uh, increasing demography and population. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that uh, okay. things can be done if we move away from sort of the purely sort of um, need to to just um, uh, sort of find solutions mm -hmm. that are uh, mutually exclusive. We might find mechanisms of, of joint, um, you know, use of, of, of uh, useful resources from water, from land, try to find ways to develop the area uh, and to make it uh, profitable for everyone. But I think if, if I might say one of the biggest concerns, I mm -hmm. think, is what was mentioned, the fact that, uh, you know, we have the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, and that is going to create a kind okay. of instability of a very different nature. The and this is something that we really need to monitor and think about and look at, because Bru uh, that is to be a much uh, more serious challenge, in my view. Bruce, briefly, if you don't mind, you have water scarcity, you have cycles of drought, which could potentially become major threats, not facing only both countries, but the globe. Couldn't this be a starting point for both countries to think about alternatives, which is basically saying that let's think about how we can manage those resources against the backdrop of this, con this situation without being bogged down in a problem about lines to be drawn? Well, certainly they're going to have to have a big say in this, and I agree that, that uh, you know, that, that a lot more investment needs to be put into this area so that there can be a level of comfort that uh, things are moving forward and that, that they aren't going to be left poor and destitute or something because of some land deal that's made. Um, you, you know, again, the, the, neither of these countries have a lot of money to put, put in toward this. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a real question of, of resources, financial resources, uh, you know, the, the kind of equipment and materials that are going to need to go into this. But, but it's something, you're right, that, that's going to confront all the communities along this border in the, in the next few years. Uh, and if they're ever going to get any kind of a border agreement, demarcation uh, reached in this area, uh, it really has to start with, with development of that area first so that people have the feeling that their future is protected no matter what, so, where the line is actually along the border and, and how far they can go before they're in another country. Bruce Paniers, Victor Olovich, Domitila Sagramoso, thank you very much indeed for your insight. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashim Ahalbara, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.